Welcome. We're going to dig into the meaning of the cross tonight, and we're going to get deep into this important issue, specifically in the, in the book of Romans. But let me first explain kind of what's going on. Um, I'm Pastor Mike Winger. I produce content every week. As most of you know, I usually do two videos a week doing theology and apologetics online, trying to teach it in a way that's very accessible, but also isn't dumbing it down. And so we're getting deep into debate issues today on penal substitutionary atonement. In other words, if you're not familiar with that term, what the meaning of the cross is. And we're going to look at Romans as our text case, as our case in point to discover what the meaning of the cross is. Uh, because the cross is totally central as Christians. The cross is central to the Christian faith. We are to live and die and die for the meaning of the cross. This has been what, you know, what Christ did, what the disciples and the apostles did, and the calling that's on us as well, is that we lay our lives down upon this, this truth, the cross of Christ. And there are many, many right now who are trying to strip the cross of its very meaning, of some of the central aspects of what the cross actually means. And I'm not trying to be sensationalistic. I just, I don't do that. Rather, I see this big issue. That's why I'm dealing with it, why I'm bringing it up to you guys. Um, it's just unfortunate. Uh, they're trying to basically say the cross doesn't mean what it means, or at least some big important part of the cross. They're stripping that out. And this is, you know, in theological terms, what, what we call the denial of penal substitutionary atonement. And I think it's a gateway to embracing all kinds of other errors about the cross. And I'll offer case in point, you know, Brian Zond, who I'll talk a little bit more about in the future, um, who seems to be rejecting the exclusivity of Christ, leaning towards some kind of universalism, and effectively watering down the urgency of turning to Jesus Christ to be saved. Anyway, kind of a big deal. And we're going to get into it today. Here's my basic case, so you don't get lost in the weeds. Here's what I'm trying to, to say with this verse-by-verse -verse stuff I'm about to give you in the book of Romans. I'm trying to say that that um, penal substitutionary atonement is true in the sense that on the cross, Jesus suffered the penalty. That's that word penal right there. The penalty. He suffered the penalty in my place, in your place, because he's our substitute. So he's the substitute suffering the penalty, and that brings us rightness with God, atonement, which is the restoration of our relationship with God, as well as dealing with the sin of man and the wrath of God. Now, everything I said, there's actually very important that those elements are all included. But what I'm not saying is this. I'm not saying that penal substitution is the entire gospel message or that it's all that the cross is about. I'm not saying that at all. But because this doctrine's under attack, I want to you know, bring it to the forefront and talk about it and defend it. I've already done a bunch of stuff on Old Testament and I'll put a playlist in the description that is my penal substitution playlist or the meaning of the cross playlist. That is going to be down there and you guys can check that out. Today, we're going to focus on Romans, the book of Romans. So I'm going to give you the passage in question right now and um, we're going to um, read through it. Then I'm going to share with you some of the controversy, the objections to this passage, how people try to reinterpret it. Then I'm going to give, give you the thorough understanding of the book of Romans. And even if you know nothing about this debate, you're going to grow in your knowledge of the book of Romans tonight, big time, uh, I think, or be refreshed in it at least. So uh, thanks for joining me, guys, in the live stream. If you have questions, you can put them in the, in the live chat with a capital Q. And I will answer those at the end of the stream. I don't want to interrupt the delivery of this material I've prepared, spent a lot of hours on. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt that with the Q&A stuff, so we put it at the end. And um, I appreciate my mods being there. All of my mods are fantastic. Uh, great hearts for the Lord, and they do this as a ministry. So um, don't give them such a hard time. <laughs> All right. Um, let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. This is like the key passage. If, if there's a debate over, over what Jesus accomplished on the cross, whether or not he like suffered for my sins, if there's that debate, because most Christians won't have this debate. They read the Bible and they just believe it, right? But some people do have it because they're they've got some concerns or problems or whatever you want to call it. Um this passage will come up in that debate. This is like a core passage, a central passage. I've tried to kind of avoid it so far so I could deal with it in today's video. So here it is. Romans 3.21, it says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. 
This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance or patience, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And short version, hey guys, that's, that's, there's the gospel about how the cross works, right? Jesus is going to the cross to deal with the sin that, you know, the sin debt we've incurred, the death he dies for us. It's to make us just so that God can be righteous and forgiving at the same time. I'll get more into detail on that. Most people, I think, when they read this and they read through Romans, they just naturally pick up on that. It's not that rough to pick up on. But here's the objections. Here's what the objectors to this doctrine will say. And you will hear this from, from various guys who are against um, penal substitution or, in my view, against a piece of the cross. That is what they're actually, I think they're actually arguing against. And I don't say that as a slight against them. I think that, that we just want to be sober about what's at stake here. Um, okay, the objections are, I'll give you four of them. One, they say, Mike, it's not judicial, right? You know, when you try to make it about penalty and Jesus is suffering the penalty for our sins, Paul's not talking about judicial terminologies. That comes from, some would say, Calvin. We already talked about how it doesn't come from Calvin in the first video in this series. We talked about church history. Um, but these legal categories, they would say, are being forced onto the text of Scripture. I'll deal with that today. Others would say, um, this isn't Jesus suffering a penalty for our sin, right? No, it, yeah, we've sinned, but there's nothing in here about him suffering the penalty for our sin. That, you're adding that to the text. That's not really in there, Mike. Others would say this is just God vindicating Jesus when it says he's justifying, that it just means he's vindicating Jesus and God is approving of those who have faith in Jesus. That's another whole thing. And it comes out of verse um, 26, how he's the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So it's like God's going to gonna approve your faith in Christ and that's all it's really saying here. Um, so it kind of strips it of this element of God punishing sin so that he has, uh, his justice is dealt with as well as forgiveness. I'll explain more later. The other objection is that Jesus isn't dealing with God's wrath. That wrath in particular is not included in the concepts of Romans 3, 21 through 26. And nowhere in the Bible is Jesus dealing with God's wrath, experiencing something that is in some way like the wrath of God. We're going to get into that stuff today. And my goal is to give you scripture. Um, that's my goal. And not just to tell you what to believe, but to show you why I think this is biblical. And so we're going to go through Romans now. We're going to skip through like kind of zoom through real quickly several different verses because I want to show you the flow of thought in Romans because if you start Oops, I turned to Romans chapter 18 and that chapter doesn't even exist. If you start in um, Romans chapter 1 and you start understanding that Paul is writing in, in especially the first, um, really the first eight chapters of Romans in particular, the whole book though, but he's writing a, a whole drawn out case argument for what the gospel means and why it's necessary. That's what he's writing, you know, carefully drawn out. So Romans 3 was never meant to be ripped out of context. It was meant to be seen as a response to the case that Paul built in Romans 1, in Romans 2, and in Romans 3, and then this culmination moment in the passage we just read in Romans 3, 21 through 26. So let's get the understanding so you can grab what Paul is trying to say, what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write so we can understand what's going on. And you see it right here on your screen. It says in Romans 1, 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The wrath of God is a front and center issue in the book of Romans long before we get to Romans 3. It's a continual issue throughout the book of Romans as we're leading up to how this, how this issue of God's wrath is dealt with and it relates to Christ. But the wrath is an issue right here. God's wrath is revealed. His wrath is directed towards two things in men, ungodliness and unrighteousness. And in my Romans verse by verse study, which I have online, we really labor on these two words, ungodliness and unrighteousness, because all the list of sins that comes after this in Romans 1, they all relate to either that rejecting God and the knowledge of God and obedience to God and also living in sin. So ungodliness, that is a wrong attitude towards God and unrighteousness, wrong actions of sin. This is the thing that makes God wrathful. So God does have wrath. It's not petty wrath. It's not like God's just ticked off. You know, God's not like a screaming toddler, nor is he like a vindictive pagan deity of old who is mad for silly reasons. God has proper holy wrath that's an expression of his goodness, 
his perfect, perfect goodness and uh, interacting with sin. And that, that is that is wrath. So Romans 1.18 gives us that. Uh, some would already object though. They would, um, they would say that um, this wrath of God that's revealed, the wrath of God is revealed. This is, Mike, this isn't God actively judging people. This is merely like a karmic type of an experience. I use the word karma here because they think God doesn't sort of actively cause anything to happen. He just sort of removes his protection and then bad things sort of happen naturally. Now, I'm not saying God can't do that, that he can't remove protection and have bad things happen naturally. But as we read on, um, we'll find out that, that it's more than just that, that there may be an element where God just, you know, withdraws protection and bad stuff happens to you. And that seems to happen in, in places in scripture. But there's another side of God's wrath, which is like God outpouring specific punishment upon individuals because of sin. So let me show you this in scripture. Um, first, I'll, I'll support the, the karmic, for lack of a better word, the karmic view. And that is in Romans 127. And we see it here in 127. Um, that, that people were sinning and it, it uses um, homosexuality as like a, as a showcase sin for, for depravity of man, which really flies in the face of our culture today. Uh, but this is, this is what it says here in Romans 127. And then it says that when they did this, when they committed these acts, they received in themselves the due penalty for their error. That seems to be um, cons- just consequences. You sin and there's bad consequences in your life, in this case, specifically homosexuality. The, the, not the identity. The Bible doesn't speak of the identity. It speaks of the, act, the activity. Um, anyway, that's a whole other debate, but we need to understand this and not read it through our 21st century uh, lens, but read it through the original understanding. At any rate, the, the physical sufferings that come upon a person are just the due penalty of their error. So this is where someone goes, see, it's just, it's just don't do that because it hurts you. That's all God's saying when he has wrath. His wrath is really, he's not doing anything. He's just watching you get hurt and he's calling that wrath. But that's not the whole story because if you read on in Romans 1 and you get to verse 32, which is not very much further, it says that people who are living in sin, and here it just speaks of all manner of sin, all kinds of categories of sin. It says that they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things, quote, deserve to die. Think about that. Those who practice such things deserve to die. That is God's statement about not just what will happen to you, but what you deserve because of your sins. And this we get from Genesis on down, right? In Genesis, we read about them eating of the tree and God's like, you're going to die the day you eat of that. And it was, it seems like punishment, right? It doesn't just seem like things that happen, but it seems like God's active punishment upon humans for their sin. Read throughout the Old Testament, even into the book of Revelation. God's wrath is more than just him letting bad things happen. It's, it's him actually punishing or, you know, bringing, uh, bringing suffering on people for their sin and wickedness. And here it says that men actually deserve to die. So how can anyone reading this deny that death in Romans, along with the rest of scripture, death is the just punishment for sin? So here's a a penalty. So penalty of death, wrath, this stuff's all in the concept already in Romans 1, but it gets, it gets bigger as we go on. Romans 2 verse 2, it says, we know the the judgment of God uh, rightly falls on those who practice such things. Speaking of those who do the same kind of sins in Romans 1. It's God's judgment, um, not not just his disapproval, I judge that that's wrong, but rather his judgment, his active penalty, suffering kind of judgment, that that's right and appropriate. This is what Romans 2 says. Now, many of those who fight against penal substitution will also fight against the idea that God would ever pour out wrath, that he would ever just punish sin, just as if it was just just in and of itself to simply punish sin, where it's not healing anyone, it's not fixing any anybody's life like the sinner's not getting better they're just getting punished but it seems as though scripture's telling us there is some pure justice and goodness in god simply punishing sin now i don't have a problem with this and i think those who do have a problem i think your moral compass is off and i think that you've and i i say this please consider the following that your moral compass is off and you are judging things immoral which are actually good and proper and perhaps your life experience has clouded your judgment on this issue. Perhaps your inability to perceive things from the holiness of God has clouded your judgment on this issue. You see it from the from the the sin stained state of man. You know you're amongst. It's like when you're a smelly person amongst smelly people, and you're like, man, we don't smell that bad, <laughs> but you do though. You know, and and God's righteousness reveals to us. 
how bad we smell. There's my analogy for you. <clears throat> Romans 2.5 actually you know, reinforces this even stronger. It says, but because of your heart and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. Okay, this is now help for us to understand. It's not as though we're just experiencing pain in this life because of our sin, but rather, Paul tells us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that when we live in sin, we don't just suffer in this life. We're storing up some future wrath in a, in a future day of God's judgment and wrath. This is, this is on the day when, of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Notice his judgment here is called righteous or appropriate, correct, good, honorable, just, right. When God punishes sin and sinners, it's perfectly right. Now, here's where I want to pause for a second and say, I, I try to think of who my audience is as I do these videos and uh, these teachings. And I, and I think in our current generation that many of them, many of the audience will be really resistant to the idea that God righteously punishes sinners. Like just that very idea is going to sort of bother them. And I'm gonna, I, I, I just want to say this is, this is part of the moral degradation of our culture. We're not able, we think we're thinking morally when really we're just thinking self-righteously. And thinking self-righteously causes you to think people don't ever really deserve punishment or certainly I don't. But thinking morally, properly thinking morally, you start to see how depraved and how messed up our culture is and how much sin is in your own life and your own heart. And you see what Paul is saying, I'm storing up wrath for that future day when judgment comes. And that's the condition of mankind. If we're really brutally honest with ourselves, about ourselves, um, then we realize we're in trouble. So that's Romans 2.16. There's a future judgment. God will express his wrath. So don't tell me this is Old Testament only where God judges people with wrath. No, nope. in fact, in fact, it says here, did you miss this? Um, Oh, I have, you haven't, you couldn't have, you could have missed it because I didn't read the scripture yet. Let me read it in verse 16. Um, it speaks about that future day when judgment comes. And it says, on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. There's a future day when God's going to judge people and judge their secrets. And Jesus is ultimately the future judge as well. He's, he's our deliverer as well as our judge. Read the New Testament, right? But look at this. It says, according to my gospel. It is a gospel truth that God judges. This blows my mind and it's very unpleasant for some of the watered down trying to be culturally appropriative, you know, gospel presentations that I hear today. And um, no, it, it is according to the gospel. God judges the secrets of men. There's a future day when wrath comes. God's going to judge men. That's part of the gospel. Okay, so we can't just say this is some Old Testament thing and Jesus fixes it or like Brian Zahn says, Christ closes the book on judgment. I think Steve Chalk uses similar terminology and these guys are, um, it's, they're, they're just, they're wrong and they're wrong about future judgment and the consequences of, of watering down the warnings of scripture um, have to be severe, I'm sure. Okay, so Paul makes it worse um, because the Jewish person would agree that these Gentile people are all under God's wrath. Now, keep in mind, we're just building up to Romans 3. Romans 3 is going to answer all the problems brought up by Romans 1, 2, and 3, the first part of chapter 3. Romans 3 is going to so solve the problems that we're talking about here. But to understand Romans 3, you got to understand these problems. See, because they're part of the equation. Um, so in Romans 1, it talks about all, how wicked people are, how sinful they are. Romans 2 uh, he, he turns this on the Jew as well. And he's like, hey, Jewish person, don't be thinking, oh yeah, those godless Gentiles, they're so messed up. He highlights the sin of the Jewish person as well. So he's like, says, hey, everyone is under sin. This is Romans 2 is actually a misunderstood passage, frequently misunderstood. I'll give you an example, verses 14 and 15. Um, it says that when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they're a law to themselves, even though they do not have law. They show the work of the law written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Because it's sort of the compound sentences here can be a little confusing. The idea is this. The Jews have the written law of Moses, which makes it, you look at the law and you go, wow, I'm really not doing that. I must be a bad person. That's kind of what you're supposed to learn from it. What do the Gentiles have? Well, they have the law of conscience. The Gentiles are, are aware internally they're, they don't have God's law, you know, written through Moses, but they have a law of conscience. So they also are aware of their own guilt. We both have a mirror to hold up, to look at and say, Jew or Gentile, you know, you're a sinner who's fallen short of God's glory. This is something all people are aware of in and of themselves, unless they have some kind of real callousness in their minds. 
Romans 3.19 then. Romans 3.19. We, we continue the thought process of the book of Romans. 3 verse 9, excuse me. Um, so he says to the Jews, are, are you better off? No, not at all. We've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. That's So Romans uh, 3 now is like the payoff. Romans 1 and 2, he's like, Gentiles have sinned. Jews have sinned. Romans 3, everyone sinned. Right? And that results in God's wrath. This is the context of Romans. You can't escape these ideas. If Jesus doesn't deal with God's wrath, then we're all in trouble, right? <laughs> if we don't have something to deal with it. Uh, Romans 3.10 reinforces this. It says, it is written, uh, none is righteous, no, not one. And then he quotes a bunch of different Old Testament scripture here to just reinforce how much everyone is a loser, spiritually speaking. We're sinners and we need a savior. We're not just people who make mistakes. We're sinners who are storing up wrath and God who is righteous will exact that wrath upon us with suffering in the future. Verse 19, now we know that uh, what, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and all the, world, the whole world may be held accountable to God. So now we have this legal terminology and I'll get to this a little bit later as well. But remember the accusation, all these legal concepts, Mike, this is, this is not in Paul. That Paul doesn't mean it legally. He, it's all relational to him. Well, there's a relational aspect for sure. Paul talks a lot about that. But he also talks about the legal aspect. Here we have the law is doing something, right, so that we might have our mouths stopped and be held accountable to God. God wants the law to hold us accountable. I think I think you get the point. I'll move forward. Um, so here's an objection to everything I've said so far. They'll say, Mike, God's righteousness isn't seen when he pours out wrath. It's seen when he forgives sin and just lets it go. Well, that is that is cute, but I don't know that it's true. In fact, I would say it's half true. I, I do see it. There's, there's a way you see God's righteousness when he forgives sins. And that's because he punished him in Christ. So you can see his righteousness in it now that Christ is there. But other than that, the statement's utterly false. And Romans 3 verses 5 and 6 helps us with this. Here's Paul dealing with objectors. It says, uh, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God's, God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? Right? I speak in a human way. By no means. So anybody who wants to tell you, any theologian, any pastor, any popular hippie looking book writer today who wants to tell you that God is unjust if he inflicts wrath on people, Paul directly addresses that here and says, by no means, no way, that is just plain wrong. Why? Why is that so wrong? Because then how would God judge the world? That is God's very position as judge of the world requires him to punish sin. It's a necessity of his role as judge. This is not something that we teach because we're forcing legal categories on the text of scripture. This is moral categories having to do with the goodness of God. If God is good, he will punish sin because he's good. Think about that. If, if, it, if it takes a minute to sink in, think about it. This is, this is a good thing when God judges. We just don't like it because we're the sinners, right? You know, um, prisoners don't like prison bars. Why? Because they're on the wrong side of them. But the rest of the, co the community generally likes prison bars, right? Because we're on the right side of them. We tend to skew our moral perspectives based on which side of the bars we're on. And when it comes to the gospel, we're on the wrong side of the bars. So we are tempted to water down how bad sin is or how rightful judgment is. But the scripture doesn't, doesn't stand for any of that. So yes, they say um, those are legal categories. God doesn't doesn't really use legal categories. Let me just give us a reminder again, because here's an, uh, this is something I've heard over and over again as I've been interacting with people who deny penal substitution, who I think strip the cross of some of its essential meaning. Here's some legal categories, right? Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress their own, uh, who, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's God's wrath, it's revealed from heaven, and it's against sin. Okay, that's, that, those, are, those are legal categories uh, in the Old Testament, New Testament as well. In Romans 1.27, we read that um, it, the penalty, that the penalty that they're receiving is their due penalty. And even the word penalty is literally used here. So sin incurs a penalty. This is just plainly what scripture says. I shouldn't have to point this out. This, 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 there should be no debate here. It exists because of I don't know why it exists. I have theories, but I don't want to share them. <laughs> All right, Romans one thirty two says, um, though they though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things, 
That would that'd be those who sin. They actually deserve to die. It's a right thing. This is a justice thing. These legal categories are being pushed upon us. I'll actually add to this from the Old Testament. Exodus 23, 7, where God says, I will not acquit the wicked. I will not acquit the wicked. Think about this. God's refusal to acquit the wicked. But that's kind of what the wicked getting off requires, isn't it? Like I have, wait, if I'm not going to get punished for my sin, I have to be acquitted. But God says he won't acquit the wicked. So then I'm going to be punished. That I'm confused by that. Well, let me, let me, and this is good. I want you to be confused by that because only the cross can, can solve this riddle. The riddle gets harder in Exodus 34, verse six and seven. Where it says, um, and God's proclaiming his goodness here in Exodus. He's speaking to Moses and it says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Now that's where everyone wants to stop right there. We'll just stop. We won't, we won't go any further, but God's not done. Yeah, he says he forgives, but look what else he says. That he will by no means clear the guilty. So he's going to forgive, but he will not clear the guilty. How on earth does God achieve forgiving us without clearing the guilty? Somehow, a reckoning for the guilt of man must be made. God's righteous goodness requires it because his right expression against sin is his wrath. Okay, so now you see what, what Paul is getting at in Romans and what's setting up the stage. This is the conundrum. It would be unrighteous for God to not punish sin. Yet God wants to forgive sinners. What does he do? How can he be righteous and still inflict or and not inflict wrath on me? How can he be righteous and not punish me? He won't compromise his righteousness. Hence, we get to Romans 3, 21. Now that you see the background, well, let's read it again. And then we're going to go through it a little more carefully. You should understand this passage, hopefully better than ever before for most of you, I, I imagine, um, after uh, today. Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. So we get this idea that the, the righteousness is apart from the law. See, because through the law, I sin and now I'm going to be killed. So God's righteousness through the law will be through punishing me. Okay, but... But this is where someone would say, see, God's just going to wipe it away. He's just going to forgive our sin. There will be no legal requirement of suffering. No, that's not what he says because look at how Paul qualifies it. He says, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. See, the law and the prophets bear witness to God's righteousness being revealed this way through either prophesying of Christ or through the typology of the Old Testament in the sacrifices, which we talked about in the previous video in this series, uh, two videos in this series. We dealt with Old Testament penal substitutionary texts and that is how the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So God won't punish me, but there will still be an accounting for my sin. And that is what the law and the prophets bear witness to. Verse 22 says, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. We're accessing this by faith. So not by works, by faith. That's a huge point for Paul. We're saved by, by faith apart from our works. I love the book of Romans so much. It, if people would study... With no commentaries and just read the book of Romans and really try to follow the flow of thought, you would never get caught up in a cult. <laughs> like It's an amazing, amazing book. Um, okay, so the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For There is no distinction. And no dis what is no distinction? Well, he's talking about Jews and, Jews and Gentiles. Remember in chapter 1, Gentiles have sinned. Chapter 2, so have Jews. Chapter 3, yeah, y'all are sinners. Y'all deserve God's wrath. Y'all got it coming. And then Jesus is the way out. Right? So there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's us. Universally condemned, universally guilty. And we're justified by his grace as a gift, not as a work, as a gift. Okay, but how does that work? How does it work that we're justified apart from works? Well, it's through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this concept of redemption, we get this whole idea of being redeemed and we go... Redemption calls to mind the Passover when God redeemed his people. And the Passover was one of our central texts in the book of Exodus for penal substitution in the Old Testament. And he'll also get, give us the other central text, um, uh, one of the other central texts here as we read on. So verse uh, 
24 tells us though that we're justified and that that is a, a big and important word we're justified that is we're made to be just uh, to understand what Paul means by justified, you can find the same word being used a little bit earlier, just a few verses back in Romans 3.20. Romans 3.20 tells us that by the works of the law, no human will be justified. None of us can be justified in God's sight through the law because we just find the knowledge of sin. We find out that we're sinners. So I won't be justified through works, but through Christ, through faith in Christ, I will be justified. Justified, just as if I'd never done anything wrong. And so, it's my fun definition for it. Um, it's a good song too. Um, okay, so Romans 3.24 is, is giving us this idea of being justified and, you know, getting it through the redemption that is in Christ. And then verse 25 and 26, these verses are going to explain how this works. Okay, so Christ redeems us and we're justified by his grace. But this again is where, you know, the, I think the anti-PSA crowd, they, they would probably prefer we just took verse 25 and 26 out of Romans 3 because this is going to explain how the redemption works. So when I look at the cross and say, how does that work? Like, okay, Jesus dies. How does that help me? Why does this, why is this needed to help my life? Why can't God just forgive me? Why does Christ have to die? I don't understand. Well, Romans 3, 25 and 26 explains how and why that is. So here we go. Here we go. Verse 25 first brings up this word propitiation. And let me tell you what this word means. Hilasterion in the Greek. And they debate on all this stuff. Um, but just know this. Everyone debates on everything. Just because there is a debate on a passage doesn't mean we don't have a good reason to believe certain things about it. And, and we do have a good reason for this word propitiation to, to at least acknowledge the following. And uh, Douglas Moo in his commentary on uh, the book of Romans, he goes into detail on this word propitiation and how it should be translated, gives his whole case for it. He's a well-respected scholar from Cambridge. Go look up his Roman study if you want to get more details. I actually found some of it online for free. And you can you can just look up Douglas Moo, M-O-O, um, and look up the word propitiation with his name. You should find it. So propitiation is connected to the place of mercy in the Old Testament. What is that place of mercy? That is the, the mercy seat inside the temple. There was like the holy place, the holy of holies, the holiest spot. They'd only go once a year. In that, in that spot, they had a mercy seat or the covering on the Ark of the Covenant. So this is like, you know, this is the whole, you know, Indiana Jones, you know, Last Crusade. This is what people think of when they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Well, it's that lid on the Ark of the Covenant with the two angels with the wings that come close to intersecting each other. That is the uh, mercy seat, the helisterion. In the Greek Old Testament, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, this is the word helisterion they typically use to talk about that mercy seat. Paul is using it here to refer to the place where our atonement is achieved. Um, he doesn't mean that Jesus is just is the mercy seat, but rather he's been put forward as a mercy seat as a mercy seat. So Paul's referring to the function of the mercy seat, not just the existence of it. And there's images here of Jesus being the very presence of God, because that's where God's present was, presence was in the temple. But there's also this wonderful idea that there's only one sacrifice in the Old Testament that they would bring inside and they would actually sprinkle on the mercy seat. And what is that sacrifice? It's the day of atonement sacrifice. And that is the sacrifice I dealt with Two videos ago when I, in this series, it's in the playlist down below in the description. Um, when I went through this whole topic uh, in detail, we talked about the Day of Atonement, how it's penal and substitutionary. What I'm saying is scripture affirms scripture here. You can't escape the penalty and substitutionary side of Jesus dying on the cross for my sins in my place. You can't get away from it. The Bible won't let you escape it unless you uh, really close your eyes to these things. So there we go. Um, uh, verse 25, though, let's read the whole verse here. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Um, notice this. And this, this I always notice. Uh, when, when There's people who want to debate. Propitiation isn't referring to the sacrificial stuff in the temple. That's, it clearly is. Get over it. But... If you didn't even have the word propitiation there, you have by his blood, which clearly in a Levitical Jewish context is referring to a blood sacrifice and offering that was all those Old Testament offerings prefigured Christ. So this is a in my place offering. That's how Jesus redeems me. He must go to the cross to save me. It's not going to happen without the cross. God doesn't just forgive. He forgives in virtue of Christ. 
He doesn't just forgive. So it's to be received by faith. And then it was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. And now Paul is actually giving us a theological explanation for why God didn't punish sins more in the past. Why is it that David wasn't punished more? Why is it that everybody isn't instantaneously punished the second they sin? And the idea is because God is waiting upon the, the, the payment to be made through Christ so that we can come to him. And then we have the ultimatum. Either I pay for my sins or I turn to Jesus and he pays for my sins. These are, these are the choices. All right. Um, verse 25. Let's see. There's more here. Um, it was to show God's righteousness. This is, this is like some of the most jam-packed, theologically jam-packed stuff in the whole Bible, in Paul's writing here in Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. But verse 25 adds this other phrase, that the cross, what happened on the cross, this whole blood thing that Jesus did, it, re, it, re, it redeems us, it propitiates, it does all this, and it was to show God's righteousness. Now, showing God's righteousness through the cross, what does this mean? It, it means... Um, that when, when God reveals his righteousness against sin in the form of wrath, punishment on sin, that's his righteous judgment. That's what scripture in Romans tells us. Well, we see something like this happening on the cross. There's some kind of comparison to what we deserve and what Christ gets, to what we've earned and what Christ receives. There's a punishment for my sin that falls upon Jesus. That's penal substitutionary atonement. It's the revelation of God's righteousness. Now, just read in the Romans what God's righteousness is all about. It's connected to his wrath and his judgment. And so you can't just say, like some people do, well, righteousness here just means relationship or righteousness here just means faithfulness to people. Um, no, you're watering it down. That's not what it means in Romans as a whole. So, I, uh, I hope this is helpful. I, I'm trying to answer and teach this in such a way that it will communicate to the one who doesn't know about these debates and will help the one who does know about the debates at the same time. So hopefully I can manage to bless both crowds. At least I hope so. So how did God show his righteousness through the cross? Uh, there's a sacrificial offering prefigured by the Old Testament where Jesus takes the punishment due to us. And this totally rules out the idea that, um, like Brian Zahn says, um, that when Jesus went to the cross, uh, it shows that God doesn't pay back sin. That the message of the cross is God doesn't pay back sin. There is no punishment for sin. Rather, no. God's saying he won't punish you because he has dealt with the, the sin through Christ. He has uh, censored your sin in the person of Christ. So he will deal righteously with sin. And that's what the cross is showing. In the cross, God expressed his judgment toward the ungodliness and unrighteousness of sinners that we read about in Romans 1.18. Right? They deserved wrath. Romans 8.3 reinforces this concept. It says, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin. He what? He condemns sin in the flesh in order that what? The righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So God's righteousness is being exacted out upon Jesus Christ on the cross. He condemned sin in the flesh. A condemnation of sin took place on the cross that... Um, yeah, and I think it's beautiful. I think it's just beautiful. Now, I want to balance this out with some other scripture because we want to know that Jesus, while he was on the cross, he was not sinful. Christ had not committed sins. There was nothing wicked that he had done. He was him who knew no sin, right? He knew no sin, scripture says here, but he also was made to be sin. So Christ didn't know sin, but he, he was made to be sin. This is what we call imputation. This is the idea of my sins being imputed to Christ or so like legally accounted to him as though he were guilty. He, he wasn't guilty of anything, but it was as though he were guilty. And then um, it's so that his righteousness would be given to me, right? He became sin so I could become the righteousness of God. So my sin goes to him. His righteousness comes to me. This is the idea of imputation being taught in scripture. There's, there's more. Let me give you Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, it says, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Now the law reveals sin, which brings wrath, right? That's what Romans teaches us. Well, here Galatians is saying, and, and we call this the curse. You're under the curse of the law. You're under the wrath of God. Christ became a curse for us. 
So this is why, you know, I find it difficult to take scripture seriously and then make a statement like Jesus didn't experience the wrath of God on the cross. Like, I don't know how to say that with all of this biblical, you know, mentality or mindset in my head here. I don't know how to take Galatians. He, he became a curse for me. He suffered the penalty of, of, of sin and, and judgment. Uh, I don't know how to say that wasn't somehow the wrath of God. It seems to be exactly what Romans is getting at. 1 Peter 2.24, let me give you another scripture for this. It says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So Christ, he, he bore our sins on his body on the tree. And as we looked at last time, and, and when, we, when we looked at the book of Isaiah, and we talked about sin-bearing, the sin-bearing concept in scripture, the Old Testament establishes for us that this sin-bearing is not, it rules out the idea that we just sinned against Jesus. He bore my sin in the sense that I attacked him. So he suffered for my sin because I caused him to suffer by sinning against him. That's not what's being said here. Rather, it's a vicarious suffering. He is taking accountability for my sin and suffering because of what I've done. That's what's happening on the cross. Now, most Christians are going to, are, are, they've never heard of penal substitutionary atonement. They don't know this stuff. They're just going to be like, well, yeah, duh, Mike. Read the Bible. That's what it says. It's, it's the reinvention of the cross, the reimagination of the cross that's happening through largely progressive liberal um, leaders. And these guys are just trying to reimagine Christianity in their own image. And they're creating like, it's, it's like a hippie Jesus that just doesn't fit scripture. And it's the verse by verse study of scripture that will equip you against this kind of stuff the most, I think. Let's look at Romans 3.26, that next verse in our glorious passage. It says, it was to show his righteousness. And we're continuing. Oh, it's starting to rain here in Southern California. That only happens like once every uh, 15 years. So, um, all right. It was to show his righteousness, what, what God did on the cross at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I love that phrase. It's so beautiful that God is just and the justifier. Remember the conundrum of Romans 1 through 3? It's that mankind is wicked, Jew and Gentile alike. We rightly deserve God's wrath. And guess what? There's a future day when God's wrath will be poured out. This is a problem, right? It's because God is righteous, he will pour out his wrath. That's a problem for us. So how can he deal, how can he forgive us without violating that righteousness? Well, here we go. Jesus, he suffers in my place. He pays the penalty for my sin so that God can say, paid in full, your debt is paid. Your, the punishment for your sin is accomplished in Jesus. So now you can be justified and God can still be just or righteous by judging sin. He maintains his goodness as judge. He maintains his, his love um, and forgiveness for us at the same time. This is through Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus Christ. The law says you sin, you die. Jesus, we sinned. He went and died in our place. He became that propitiation, that reconciliation to us. Let's talk for a minute about wrath. A minute about wrath here. Um, I want to share a couple more scriptures for that because I, I think it's, it's something I've actually been waiting to talk about in this series and I want to bring it up. The, we, you know, most would agree that Jesus suffered, uh, most would agree, that Jesus suffered the penalty of the law, right? In Galatians 3, when it says he became a curse for us, well, that's the penalty of the law. So Christ, he suffered the penalty of the law. And, you know, can we really say that that is God's wrath? And I would say verse 15 of Romans 4 says it is. For the law brings wrath. But where there's no law, there's no transgression, right? The law brings wrath. So that when you talk about the penalty of the law, wrath is incorporated in there automatically. If Jesus suffered the penalty, he suffered the wrath. That just seems to be the biblical concept to me. And I think we need to be able to embrace that. Romans 5, 9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from him by, uh, from the wrath of God. Some want to say that God simply has no wrath for us, uh, or he's only wrathful against the things that hurt us, um, or God's wrath only ever restores. I've heard this as well. God's wrath is really about restoring people, Mike. Well, I mean, sometimes his wrath that restores people, I don't deny that. I think it's great. But to say it only restores us, well, if God's wrath only restores me, why do I have to be saved from it? Think about this. 
it's, it's because it doesn't only restore me. Sometimes it destroys, right? If we've been justified by his blood, we, we will be saved from him or by him from the wrath of God. It's God's wrath that I'm saved from through the justification I get through the sacrifice of Christ by his blood. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's throughout the text of scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. I can give you verse after verse after verse. I haven't run out of scriptures. There's even a lot more than I've shared in this series. Um, we just need to accept that penal substitution is part of what the cross means. It's not the whole story, but it is an, an essential part of what the cross means. I would go to the cat cam today, guys, but um, my cat is up on top of the bookcase, not down on my chair where I can show you her. So sometimes she likes to go up there and sleep. So that's how it is. No cat cam at the moment. I do apologize. Um, all right, let's talk about Romans 5 uh, verses 6 through 11, which is part of the section I just read. Why am I reading this? Because here's a passage where um, I think the anti-PSA guys will go to town. And... Um, let me read you the passage and then I'll then I'll just try to soak it up. Just try to take your, your natural understanding of it. I'll share with you what they say about it and then I'll share a response that comes from an actual scholar who digs into these issues quite thoroughly. And I think you'll find this uh, interesting. Romans 5 verses 6 through 11 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to die, dare, uh, dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Clearly Romans 5, big time, it's about reconciliation the restoral of the relationship between man and God. So this is relational, okay? It's judicial, especially in Romans 3, but it's also relational. Here's what they'll say. They'll say, Mike, let's pretend your name's Mike too. Then, we, then they're talking to both of us. Mike, the Greek concept of dying for someone is what's really in view here. Paul isn't thinking Old Testament concepts. He's thinking Greek first century concepts. And there's something called apiopatric death, or apiopatric sacrifice. I believe that's the correct term for it. Um, and the effect this has when they say this, they go, here's a new interpretive framework for the passage I just read. When it talks about, you know, who would somebody be willing to die for? A righteous man, a good man, some would dare to die. It's interesting. You're, you're, you feel like when you read it, you feel like there's something Paul's saying here that I'm not getting. And they go, yep, there is. And therefore, it's not really about... Um, penal substitution. So let's tease this out a little bit. Um, let me build their case, right? Here's, here's their case. And this is true. Everything I'm about to tell you is true. I'll tell you when I break from truth <laughs> in a minute when I give the rest of their case. But part of this is all true. Um, in, in the 5th century BC, there's a play by a guy named Euripides. Here I can show you his face. Where is he? Euripides. There he is. That's exactly what he looked like. For sure. Guaranteed. 100% accurate. Um, okay. He has a play called Alcestis in the 5th century BC, and it's about where Apollo, he declares that a king na named Admetus is going to die. You're going to die, king, unless you can find someone to die in your place. Someone to die in your place. And he goes around, the king goes around trying to find somebody to die for him. And Admetus can't find anybody. His parents won't do it. Even his parents, nobody will do it. Finally, he finds his wife, and she, Alcestis, says, I will die for him. And this idea of one who would be willing to die for another is a big important idea, not just in this one play by Euripides, but it's utilized later by people who were more known in Paul's time as well. And so in Plato's Symposium, you guys have heard of Plato, right? In his Symposium, written about the, in the fourth century, he talks, basically the, the, the Symposium is about a party where there's a group of people gather, gather together. And during the party, each of them is required to give a speech about the god Eros. Um, and it's, it's weird, granted, but it's also interesting, the discussions they have. One of the people who offers a speech about Eros, this, this love god, is um, a guy named Phaedrus. Um, Phaedrus, who I think was a guy. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember. Um, anyway, Phaedrus' speech, it make, he makes a big deal about how only lovers are willing to die. Oh, I should show you Plato. There's Plato. Plato. Literally, I think the statue was made out of Plato, so it's Plato, Plato. No, I made that up. 
Um, so Phaedrus' speech, what he says is that only lovers are willing to die for one another. Um, and this connects to Alcestis because the parents wouldn't die for, for him, but Alcestis would, his wife, because they love each other. And, you know, Phaedrus says, if the army was made of, of, of lovers, the army would be unbeatable because every man would be willing to die for the other and um, every person. And in Phaedrus, he specifically uses the phrase, dare to die. And now this is where people think there's a connection to Paul. Because Paul says, you know, some would even dare to die. For a good man, some would even dare to die. And Phaedrus uses this phrase, talma in the Greek. He uses it multiple times. Um, it's, or it's not just used in him. It's used multiple times in other sources as well. Plutarch, for instance. Here's Plutarch. There's Plutarch. There he is. His nose had to be reconstructed in this image because the, the nose had been smashed off in his statue. So this is a, a cosmetic uh, altered version of Plutarch. I'm thinking about a joke about getting a nose job, but whatever. Um, okay. In Plutarch, in the in, in he wrote about within, within about a generation of Paul. So now Plutarch, bringing it right to Paul's time in Greek thought, he writes also about Alcestis and how she was alone willing to dare to die on behalf of her husband. And Paul uses this phrase in Romans 5, and he uses it, it seems, unnecessarily. So the idea is that Paul seems to be talking about this Greek concept of being daring to die for somebody. And in, in the case of all these Greek concepts, they do it oftentimes because that person is someone so precious to them. It has nothing to do with sin. It has nothing to do with punishment. It's just, I'm willing to suffer for you and keep you from suffering some future fate. Um, that's the idea. And this is where people try to try to use it um, in a weird way. They want to use it and say, okay, if if um, if this dare to die concept is being drawn from sort of Greek con ideas and not Old Testament ideas, then we can now say, forget the Old Testament. Paul's just thinking of Greek ideas here, and they can try to remove penal substitution from the from the uh, from the ideas here. And this is what we hear all the time. It's this this not that thing. You know, just because there is a dare to die concept in the death of Christ, that he would dare to die, his, his love was so great for us. It doesn't mean it's not also, you know, penal substitutionary atonement. And um, the one thing doesn't prove the other thing wrong. They're just different aspects of the cross. So here's what, um, what I, Simon Gathercole says about it. Let's see. Um, okay, speaking... Hold on, I'm just checking my notes here to make sure I'm in the right spot. I should have got a photo of Simon Gathercole. I wish I could get like a statue of the guy. That would have been more appropriate. Um, okay, here's what he says. Um, Simon Gathercole, and I'm quoting him here. Uh, For Paul, the differences are more striking than the similarities. And in Romans 5, he's obviously focusing on how radically different Jesus' death is than any heroic death in the classical tradition. Jesus' death doesn't seem to fit any of the categories above very easily. So he, he talks about all the categories of Al Alcestis and all these different people. Uh, he talks actually about Seneca and Ep uh, Epictetus and all these different guys, Stoic philosophers and Zeno and all this stuff. And he says, Paul is actually not saying Jesus is just like these Greek guys. Paul is saying Jesus is different than these Greek guys. So he's not inviting a parallel comparison. He's inviting a contrast. That's the idea. Then he gives, a, Simon Gathercole gives a list of reasons why Paul, what Paul's doing is different than what the Greeks did. He says that it's a death for an enemy, not a spouse. Right? When Paul in verse 10 says that while we were enemies, Christ died for us. Paul's saying, look, it's nothing like, oh, Alcestis died for her husband who she loved. Jesus died for his enemies. That's the idea. It's very different. This would baffle Greek philosophers. Gathercole says, for a Greco-Roman philosopher, death for an enemy would have been unthinkable. Because they don't know that kind of love. Death for an enemy would be unthinkable. Um, Greco-Roman views, Simon Gathercole tells us, um, Greco-Roman views held that you had some sort of duty or obligation to die for certain people because of a healthy relationship you had with them. Friends had a requirement to, to die for one another if they had this deep idea of friendship. In fact, Greek philosophers would, would literally write philosophy on the idea of friendship. Um, actually, that's kind of interesting philosophy to read about, I think. Uh, well, Romans 5 emphasizes the exact opposite of this, right? God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We rejected the relationship. That's Romans 1. But in Romans 5, it talks about how Jesus, after we rejected him, he came and died for us anyways. Talk about love. Talk about love. Unrequited love. So the, in the Greek view, it's the relationship that leads to the sacrifice. 
But in the book of Romans and with, with Christ, it is the sacrifice that creates the relationship. Boom. Total paradigm shift. Complete opposite situation here. We are wicked. We don't deserve it. Jesus dies for us. That's the idea. Um, so someone to use this concept to suggest that um, the death is not a penalty. But Paul supplies the penal side of the death, the penalty side, thoroughly in, in chapters 1 through 4. And in chapter 5, he's giving us the relational concept. So we don't have a thin view of the cross, but we have all of these ideas. You know, and, and Paul goes on more. In, in other ideas too, inclusively talking about the cross being not only penal, not only substitution, um, but this great act of love. But also later he talks about Adam and Christ and how there's representation in the cross. How Jesus goes not only on my behalf, but he goes in my place as the new Adam. Just like Adam represents us all eating the tree, Christ represents us all hanging on the tree. That's, that's later in Romans 5. So all of these different aspects are actually very important. And they're all in the cross. I'm going to go to your guys' questions in like less than two minutes here. Um, okay, so Adam and Christ, we talked about that. Romans 5 gets into that in detail. Um, I won't do a whole study of that. But the idea is that um, penal substitution is too thin if you don't have representation in there. You don't understand that Jesus actually represents me going voluntarily on my behalf. It's not as though he's grabbed from some crowd, some innocent whipping boy to be beat for me. That, that's a, that's a, a disgusting caricature of the doctrine of penal substitution. So all of this is in the cross. And what I'm seeing in popular stuff from guys like Brian Zahn, Steve Chalk, and those guys, I'm seeing this, they're stripping some of the meaning out of the cross. And then they're vilifying it and calling it wicked. And they're strawmanning it and misrepresenting it. And I just can't see that as being the work of God. I can't see it as being the work of God. It's dishonest and it's, a, it's abusive. Um, it avoids scripture, frequently avoids the use of scripture in context and focuses on rhetoric and yeah. So the legal ideas, they're supplied by the Holy Spirit. The idea of wrath, that's a real thing. It's dealt with by Jesus or it's dealt with by you, according to the text. Penal substitutionary atonement, that's right there in the text of Old and New Testament. And the message for the world is, guess what? If you don't know Jesus Christ, you are currently right now storing up wrath for that day of judgment. You are storing up wrath. It's right, and, and in a sense, some part of you probably knows it's right because hopefully your conscience isn't so seared that you can't see your own sin. You may not like it because you're on the wrong side of the jail bars, so to speak. But if you were really honest, you'd recognize that, yeah, you do deserve that. But Jesus took it for you because he loves you so much that while you're yet an enemy, he died on the cross for your sin in your place. And if you just trust him, you will be forgiven. You will have free forgiveness, free grace, and eternal life through Jesus Christ because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You know, that anyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's beautiful. It's the gospel message. And um, there are those who want to who want to strip it of its meaning or who want to attack it. And I'm going to deal, I've done all the scripture stuff I intend to do for this. I'm going to deal next with the rhetoric and also the moral and philosophical challenges and legal challenges to the idea of the cross being sensical or good in the you know when you have penal substitution included in the concept of the cross so i'll deal with that stuff later the rhetorical stuff that that's all that's coming all that's coming i'll give you guys one last verse and then i'll go to your question psalm 85 10 i just love this scripture and i think that it really i think it gives us the um the poetic picture of the cross of penal substitution it says, steadfast love and faithfulness meet, righteousness and peace kiss each other. You see, God's righteousness by itself, I would, I would, it wouldn't be a kiss. It wouldn't be peace. His righteousness would set him at war with me. But because of Jesus Christ, because he paid the price for my sin, righteousness and peace can kiss each other. The two can come together through the cross and I can have my sins paid for and I can have my life restored and my relationship with God renewed. So those who are in Christ um, are free from sin because it has been paid for. All right, let's dig into your guys' questions. There's Mika for you. Oh, hold on. I got to pull up the right app. And I hope that you guys are being blessed by this series. I hope that it's really expanding your mind. There's certain aspects of things I'm, gonna, I'm going over that I'm not explaining in perhaps as much detail as 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 um, as what as you'd like to help you understand it fully, but 
kind of what I want this video to be as a resource for those who are already engaged in a debate on the issue. Because once it gets out onto YouTube, once it gets out onto Google, that's when they're going to find it is when they go to the website and they're like, penal substitution, help. I'm in a debate and I don't know. I, help me with scripture. And then, then they're going to find this resource and it's going to meet them right where they need it. And that's kind of how I want a lot of my content to be. I want it to meet that person who's, who desperately needs that help. And so... Um, Anyway, that's kind of how I handle it. Uh, Jacob Seiler says, what do you think of ransom theory? I personally believe it's blasphemy as it makes Christ's sacrifice a pagan sacrifice. Just wanted to know your thoughts. God bless you. Um, uh, okay, so ransom theory is a, is a fluid term. And I don't think it means one thing. So I'll say this. So, so let me tell, I'm not answering to the term ransom theory, but let me let me just say this. There's some kind of ransom happening with Jesus. He says that he would give his life a ransom for many, his words. So Jesus is definitely offering a ransom. So any concept of the cross should include ransom. Um, there are, however, those who said that the ransom he paid was paid to Satan. And that's where I have challenges with it. That's where I go, yeah, I don't think so. Excuse me. I don't think God owed Satan the ransom. And I can get into more detail and maybe I will at some point on different theories. But that would be my my view. Yeah, ransom, yes, I accept it, but not to Satan. And as far as it making it a pagan sacrifice, Christ's sacrifice is is unlike pagan sacrifices in a couple specific ways. One of them is that um, Jesus uh, went voluntarily. Uh, that's not the same as pagan ones. Also, in the cross, God is the one who is, he's giving the offering. He's giving the offering, not me. I'm not giving Jesus. Jesus is giving himself you know, through the instigation of the Trinity, he's giving himself. So this is unlike the kind of offerings going to pagan deities. Plus, a third difference is it's because of righteousness, not because of petty anger. Um, so there's several important differences there. All right, next question. John Engler says, is it a sinful or irreverent, is it sinful or irreverent to wear the cross as necklace or jewelry? Um, I don't think that it... I think it's open. I think it can be sinful or irreverent uh, when Madonna wears a cross on her neck while she's strutting around half naked trying to in invoke lust in people. <laughs> yeah, that's irreverent. Of course, absolutely that's irreverent. Um, that's the opposite of what the cross stands for. But you could wear a cross. I used to I used to wear one when I first had um, started following the Lord. And it was like, I remember my youth pastor came to me. He was like, Mike, why do you wear that cross? I think he was wanting to, want, want to know if I had a good reason. And I just, I told him, I said, well, it's just like a reminder to me that I'm following Jesus. And he was like, okay, good. So you don't think it's a good luck charm that'll protect you? And I was like, no. <laughs> so, so I think that, yeah, it depends on what your purpose is behind it. Um, yeah. Uh, Rational Evidence says, some say even if you were the only one who needed saving, Jesus would have still died just for you. Do you know anywhere in the Bible that says that? Why, why do people say that? Penal substitution is a group thing. One scapegoat for the whole community, not one person. Is it said just to make people feel special? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't know if I've really thought thought about that before, rational evidence. I think I might want to think it through. Um, I don't think I could deny that Christ would die for me if I was the only one. I don't think I could deny that. I, I would have a hard time denying it. Is it true when we say it, though? I mean, my, in my gut, I want to say it's true. I want to say if I was the only one, he would die for me. I want to say that. Um, but I, I can't think of a specific scripture that gives me that exact idea in scripture. I don't know that the idea comes up. I don't know that the question comes up in scripture. So I, I, I won't deny it, but maybe I won't go around saying it to everybody. So I don't know. You know, something to think about. Maybe I'll change my mind in five minutes when I have more time to think about it. Um, Susan Morales says, does God experience unrequited love with the rest of the world that rejects his lordship in their life? Yes. I think so. I think God's love is unrequited by those who choose sin over, over God. And this is something the world never gets. They never think of sin as a failure to love God. But it is all through scripture. Sin is a failure to love God. This is why the whole law can be summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Sin is always a failure to love God. The world, in fact, even when I, I engage with skeptics, they never talk about sin like it's some sort of offense to God. And I understand this, especially those who've calloused their hearts to the existence of God. But that's the very nature of sin. It's an offense. It's a personal offense against God. 
deep, deep stuff that's uh, that's in that. Um, slightly burnt toast says, "I have a question about idolatry. Are statues, paintings, and other figurines idolatry?" Um, no, they're not in and of themselves. So I used to think that when I was real young in the Lord, and I remember reading the scripture of the Old Testament, and I was reading about the temple and how they put images of angels on the inside of the temple, and then in the mercy seat they actually had these like statues of angels on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. And I was like, wait a minute, don't make a graven image. I thought you weren't supposed to make a graven image. Turns out I just didn't understand what that meant. It didn't mean don't make one ever at all. It meant don't make one and worship it and use it as some sort of object of your worship. And so we never see in Judaism, proper Judaism, biblical Judaism, we, we never see them worshiping images, directing praise at images, praying to images, those types of things. That That is a, is a bad thing. But having, say, a stained glass window, you know, it can be a beautiful thing, it can be a wonderful thing, it can be a story of theology in and of itself. But if I start rotating my body towards that cross on the wall as I, as I worship, that's a little weird. You know, that's something, something's going off right there. Um, Nye Lady in Red says, Hi, Pastor Mike. Is there an official government record of, from Rome of Jesus' crucifixion? I briefly looked into this once and surprised and was surprised of how hard it was to find this answer. Um, I, I get, I, not that I know of. Um, I don't know if we have any official records of any crucifixions from the first century at all. So I'm not sure if we have that kind of thing. I've never heard of it. What we do have is we have uh, Josephus, who's a Roman historian, who records that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And though there's some debate about what Josephus said, how much of it was was original, the scholarly consensus is that that part is original. So legitimately, Josephus did record Roman, not a, not a believer in Jesus. Um, he records in his Roman history, he records the crucifixion of Christ. That's probably the best thing in that, close to what you're asking for. Now, uh, Nikao says, Jesus says, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven in this world, nor in the world to come in Matthew 12. What does this mean? And we, does this mean we will still have the potential to sin as the redeemed? Oh, good question. That's an interesting question. So if it won't be forgiven in the world to come, does that mean I might do it in the world to come and then it won't be forgiven? Like I can lose my salvation after being in heaven or being with the Lord or, or in the final state of things, which are two different things. Um, now, I, I don't think so. I think the grammar of what Jesus is saying, as I understand it, um, Nikau, is that if you do this sin, it's not going to be forgiven um, eternally. So you did it while you were alive, and after you die, it still won't be forgiven. I think that's all he's saying there. I don't think it relates to doing it in the in the afterlife, so to speak. It refers to consequences in the afterlife for doing it right now. 4Z Mom says, what does Romans 1 for mean when it says declared with power? Ooh, that's a let's go to that verse. Let's go to that Bible verse. Romans 1 4. You know, I, I get um, comments from some people about how I get excited about the Bible. And and I do. I just genuinely get excited about scripture. But I just want to let you guys know, like, I'm literally more excited about the Bible now than I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, I'm, I grow in my excitement and appreciation of scripture as I study and really try to learn it and see the depths of the goodness of it. And anyway, it's just genuineness. Uh, Romans 1, 4 says, and he was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. And it tells you by his resurrection from the dead. So how is Jesus declared to be the son of God in power? By being raised from the dead. So Jesus, you know, if he had just died and stayed in the grave, what would that mean about who Jesus was? Well, it would be like, how do I know he's the Messiah? How do I know who he is, who he claimed to be? He just, he died and didn't come back. But the resurrection is like the vindication of the, of the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He is the victorious one. He did please God through that offering. He is the one, right? He's declared to be the Son of God. It didn't mean he became the Son of God when he resurrected, but rather the resurrection tells us something truthful about who Jesus is. So there you go. Awesome stuff. Um, Eddie Vasquez says, if a person self-sacrifices to save someone, are they saved? Um, uh, no, uh, so God doesn't present the path to heaven like one really good work will get you there, but rather there's a perfect standard of righteousness 
And apart from Christ, I'm judged by my works. And I'm judged by all of my works, not just the last thing I did, some great act of selflessness at the very end of my life. I'm judged by all of my works. And here's maybe one of the reasons for that. Because all of my works is what makes up who I actually am. I don't know if, and maybe I'm going a little bit on a limb, so just, just consider the following. Maybe I'm stretching things here. But it seems to me, in my understanding, that when I sin, it actually changes who I am from the inside out. That sin is something I do, but it's, it's when I do it, it affects the who I am of me. And so a life of regular sin, which all of us have apart from Christ, a regular sin where I am every day I do not love God with my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Every day I fail in sin. What am I becoming? Like how bad am I really? How smelly am I actually and have no idea? And so then if I did one great act, you know, um, upon my death that isn't going to, oh, well, that'll wipe it all out. But I mean, it will leave a memory that will cause people to be grateful and to love me, you know, and that sort of thing. But that doesn't actually make me a good person. So yeah, I think that God's going to judge them. If he judges you by works, he judges you by all of them and by your actual character, not just by one great thing. Uh, Jeff Warren says, Pastor Mike, between the way you and William Lang Craig explain it, penal substitution makes total sense to me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, that is awesome. And I think William Lang Craig has great stuff on penal substitution. I recommend his little book. He's got a little 100-page book on the atonement. Um, that is fantastic, and I would highly recommend it. Um, I'll be sharing some of his content in, in the next videos in this in this series, which will be, I'm hoping people don't get tired of it. But yes, it's an, ex it's an extensive series, but it's about the meaning of the cross. So it's absolutely, totally worth it. Um, Gatekeepers Youth Group, question for Mike. Since we are not saved by works, why does Paul give uh, lists of people, groups that will not enter the kingdom of God as in Corinthians? One could argue that it is works. Yes, Um I see what you're getting at. So the question, uh, I, I'll give you my short answer. My short answer is this. The regular practice of those sins, you know, he gives and he gives a list in, in, including, um, well, let me see if I can find it. It's first, is it 1 Corinthians 6, 9? 6, 8, and 9 maybe? Yeah, 6, 9. Okay, let's, let me show it to you guys. Here's the list. And there it is. Um, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Sounds like works, right? Well, there's two ways to look at it. One, I can say this refers to those who have not yet come to Christ. You, you do live a life of sin before Christ. Um, and so you could say this refers to them because in verse 11, he's like, hey, and such were some of you. You guys used to be that way, remember? Uh, but on the other side, I can say this, that those who've been truly transformed by the Holy Spirit aren't going to live those lives. And that is a general truth that scripture sort of counts on. Read the book of James or 1 John. It seems to assume that you're not going to live this perpetual sinful lifestyle. And I don't just mean you won't deal with sin till you die, but you're living a drunkard's life, the reviler's life, the swindler's life. This may be evidence that you were not actually saved in the first place. So it's not as though you're losing your salvation because of it. It's rather showing you that you're missing something, um, that you have not yet actually been regenerate by the Holy Spirit because he would change you from the inside out. So it is sobering, but it's not works for salvation. A um, couple more questions and we'll call it a night. CDTV says, hi, Mike, is there anything we can pray for you specifically for? Um, yeah, you know, uh, wisdom with what to do with my YouTube channel. I, I, you know what's amazing about this ministry? I can do anything I want. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't want to just do anything. But it, just the idea that I could go in any direction with this online ministry is, is, is amazing to me. And I just ask you to pray that I would have wisdom to cover important issues, whether they seem important to others or not, to just cover the stuff that the Lord wants to get out there to be able to bless people, minister to them, to better be able to outreach uh, through this ministry to the unsaved, all that kind of stuff. Just prayer for the effectiveness and direction in this ministry. That would be absolutely huge. Really, I do mean that. Um, finally, uh, R. Rodriguez says, some, some link atonement, 
the torture of sinners in hell, and the torture of Jesus. But what about Romans 6.23, which says the wages of sin is death. He paid by dying, not by being tortured, no? Uh, well, um, R. Rodriguez, I reject the term torture when it comes to how God deals with sinners. I think that in modern vernacular, the word torture implies in and of itself unjust treatment. I think the word torture just means unjust treatment. I think that's what it means to most people. And so I do not use that word. I totally reject that word because any hint of injustice in the acts of God is something I utterly reject, right? Don't even go down that road of such delusion as to think that God would do something unjust. Um, so I would say that to start with. Um, but yes, uh, as far as w what the wages of sin is death. Okay, it's true the wages of sin is death, but the Bible speaks of death as being a more robust thing than just physically dying, right? It talks about the second death and that sort of thing in Revelation. So so yeah, I will talk more about this, I think, in future videos. I probably won't get into it super detailed right now. Um, so let me just say, future videos, I'm going to deal with objections to the atonement that are a couple more videos in this series that are about um, like like that kind of thing where, hey, logically, how does this work? Okay, I accept it scripturally, but explain how it works. So that's one of the things I'm going to dig into. Anyway, I hope it helps. Hey, guys, I'm going to be at this, this conference this week um, in San Diego. I'm not speaking or anything. I'm just going to be attending the ETS or EPS conference. Evangelical Theological Society and the Evangelical Philosophical Society. They gather together and do a conference every year. Today, uh, this time around, it's in San Diego. I'm actually going to be attending to that. Attending that. It means that next Tuesday, I'm not going to be able to prep like a thorough, thoughtful live stream. So I'm going to do a Q&A of some kind next week. I'll, I might do, maybe I'll do a Q&A just for skeptics. Tell me what you, you put in the comments. Should I do a Q&A for just skeptics or should I do a Q&A for... Um, for new believers, again, that was very popular. People seem to really be blessed by that. Should I do a QA and a for uh, about, you name it, like uh, about, I don't even know. I, I have some ideas, but you tell me your ideas and then vote up things that you, you like in the permanent comments on the video so I can just see, you know, what would be a blessing to you guys because this ministry is for you. So thank you so much. Thanks to my mods for being there. God bless you. Keep your eyes on the Lord and rest in his finished work on the cross. He paid for every sin. It is all dealt with in Christ. Your, your forgiveness is secured 2,000 years ago by the sacrifice of Christ, who when he was on the cross, right before he died, he cried out, it is finished. It's done. And that word, uh, tetelestai, means paid in full. They would stamp that on the uh, release papers for prisoners, basically saying, hey, your sentence is paid. There's no more payment to be made for this. And uh, we rest in the finished work of Christ. Not at all in our goodness, our good works. So, Lord bless you.